Okay, welcome to this uh, short workshop on Ray Shader. Uh, my name is Sam and I'm a digital fellow with Graduate Center Digital Initiatives. And this video is for if you took part in the week, the workshop last Friday, um, or if you're generally interested um, in Ray Shader and want to see uh, what an introductory session of it might look like. Um, this workshop does assume that you have an introductory level of uh, knowledge of R. Um, if you don't, you know there's plenty of resources online for you to get there. Um, this is not going to be a hugely demanding uh, session, uh, but you do need to know about how to enter instructions and commands into our studio, so best to start there. Um, of course, I'm going to start here with an empty script, and one of the first things that, first thing that we almost always do with an R session is uh, turn on the necessary uh, packages or attach the necessary packages we have uh, to our environment. So here I'm just going to install, I'm going to install and attach uh, dev tools or developer tools and tidyverse. I should say this is attaching not installing. Installing is a separate process. Um, we also need to install for those that haven't done this before to install and attach um, the rate the RGL and Ray shader packages. Um, also, if you're using a Mac, if you're using a Mac, um, you also need to install um, a small piece of open source software called XQuartz um, and have that open. Uh, so bear that in mind. It's just a small piece of software that opens up a graphics window um, on your computer. Um, it's it's. It's in there on a Windows uh, computer, but not on a Mac. So just just make sure you have that installed. Um, and for us, for everybody, um, you want to install Ray Shader from the GitHub repository. And the reason for that is that on the CRAN repository, um, the version of Ray Shader hosted is out of date. It's an old version that has a bug in it. And the most recent version of Ray Shader, as of the new year in 2023, is the one that is available on Tyler Morgan Wall's GitHub. So. Tyler Morgan Wall was the guy that created uh, this package. Uh, oops, sorry, Ray Shader. So we we type in here the username and then the name of the package. Now I'm not going to do this because I already have the packages installed. Um, my recommendation is actually that you install uh, RGL first if you don't already have it. Um, hopefully you won't find that these packages conflict with anything else that you already have installed and attached in your uh, your own session of R, your own uh, computer, uh, but you may have to play around and un uninstall or deattach um, various packages to make sure that these work fine. This is a very small package um, that helps with opening graphics windows, and this is the larger package that should take about five, a couple of minutes, between two and five minutes, uh, to download and install. One important thing um, that you need to, that you should, that you should bear in mind about Ray Shader is when prompted to uh, when prompted whether to install to install updates, just press enter in the console uh, to skip updates. Uh, don't press one or anything else. Uh, and this means that you install the right version without anything from the CRAN repository. Okay, so um, at this stage, I'm going to assume that you've done, you've installed this. Though you should pause the video or take the time that you need to install and attach the the Ray Shader package. When it's downloaded and, and available for you, you'll see in the packages window here in the bottom right that they're actually they break into three separate ones. You've got here Ray Image, Ray Render, and Ray Shader. I'm just going to click these boxes, but of course, as you probably know. Um, you can type out the command as well, just like, oops, not like that, like this. Um, ray shader, ray image, ray render, and also the RGL package. So, um, the first stage of this workshop, um, now that we have the package available, is to create a file that's temporarily going to hold our downloaded data. So we'll create a file for our data. Um, so I'm going to call it my data and um, that will be the temp file. You can see it's come up there in the global environment. 
some of this for some of you this may be very simple for those of you some of you this will be the first time you're looking at this but that's okay we'll go through it um, just stage by stage this way um, the next step is to download our raster image um, my data that we've just created is the destination file so I'm going to use here a command called download file in the base up in base R and it's uh, going to be at this URL which I'm going to paste here rather than type out here just to make sure I've got it right is Tyler Morgan Wall's personal website and it's a zipped tiff uh, it's a it's a date it's a raster file that's been zipped up and the destination is my data so let's see how that goes it looks okay it looks like it's been downloaded and in there we now should have the data that we need so the next step is to use the raster package to unzip and load the raster image uh, for those of you that are familiar with you using read.csv this is like using the, the function read.csv or anything similar like that which is telling R to open up the data in the way that it knows how so it's local tiff that's what we're going to call our um, our file here I'm going to use the raster package the raster function and we're going to unzip first um, the folder my, the file my data into dem And there we can see in our environment here on the top right, we have our data. We have our raster file. Um, R seems to recognize what it is, and it's ready, we're ready to work with this now. Um, at this stage, uh, as you have an optional step here, which is to delete the original, original files. Um, that we have attached and this just means um, we unlink my data the original temporary file and you can like if, if you like of course you can also remove it entirely be aware of course that now that's been deleted our temporary file um, we can't get that back that's been deleted permanently now um, now we have our raster data um, and just for interest um, you can see that we can actually plot the raster sorry the raster image um, in a basic uh, plot. Um, so if we just do this and we put here local tiff, we can see that the plots that has come up here, uh, we get our first indication of what the file actually looks like. Um, we get a sense of elevation, we get a sense of extent with x and y coordinates, and um, we can get an overview really of what we should expect to see once we start model it, modeling it in 3D. Um, R has already taken uh, a look at the data and made its like color distributions relevant to the height uh, to, to the variations in the data that it sees. So um, let's go ahead with one of our first um, uh, functions from the ratio package, which is to create a matrix from the raster image using ratio. In, for our case, LMAT um, means elevation data into matrix. Oops, elevation, elevation into matrix. And so we will do, we'll take the LMAT, uh, that's what we're going to call it, and we'll use the function raster to matrix, and into this function we will put our local TIFF that we've just been working with. So what's going on here is we're going to create a matrix called LMAT um, out of the TIFF file that we have. It's going to be turning a raster image into a series of rows and columns. And here we have now very quickly in, the, in our case, uh, we have the matrix set up. We can open it in a separate tab. And here we have the full array of data, uh, which is really quite something. 
And uh, if you're working with larger files, this file in particular will be a lot larger and may take a lot longer to process. So be aware of that. The file we're working with quite, is quite small today. It's the demo file, um, but it can get a lot more complicated um, as you use much bigger files. So um, be careful what you put into the uh, working environment here. Okay, so for those of you who are interested, of course, we can also um, just preview the data. Sometimes this is uh, of interest is to make sure we have um, the right material um, in our environment. You can take a look at the head, the tail, and take a look here in the console at the data we have available. Um, doesn't It's not telling us a great deal right now, um, but it's good to know that perhaps the, figure, the, the, data, the data is in the right range. Um, so we'll do our first shading um, uh, instruction right now, which will um, give us the first insight into what Ray Shader can do with the data made available to it. Um, so the sphere shade function maps a color texture onto a surface by spherical mapping. Um, and our available textures are paste here. Ray Shader comes with a series of available textures I am Hoff 1 through five, 4, along with Desert, Black White, and of course Unicorn, which is a bunch of crazy colors. Um, you can make your own custom textures. Um, I, that's, I won't go through that today, but know that it is an option. So the process here, uh, which will be repeated um, a couple of times now for the rest of the workshop, is we take the elevation matrix, add a pipe, and then we do sphere shade, as you can see. Uh, R knows it's a, uh, a function from the ray shader package. Um, inside the brackets, we're going to put here texture, and we today will choose the desert function. Um, the final part of this now is to plot the map here. So it's three lines for functions, and there we go in the bottom right. We have a nice uh, rendering, a first start rendering um, of what this looks like. You can get a sense there is similarities between the image that you see here in the first plot and the second one now that we're starting to shade in the elevation. Okay, now one important thing to know here is that with the sphere shading, this is a this is a graphics rendering process that shines, it, it, it records how light reflects off a surface Within, inside a sphere of infinite size. Um, it's an old rendering technique um, that was often used for computer games. And what you can do is shift, it, it has one light source and you can shift the light source or sun direction um, using sun angle. So I'm gonna copy our previous lines of code here. And inside the brackets, I'm going to put sun, ang sun angle equals 45. What you want to do is put a value between 1 and 360, i.e. 360 degrees. And you'll see now, if I execute this, you'll see how the light changes on the plot. It's almost like an opposite direction now. Um, and this is, you know... Largely for like many other functions, this package is largely aesthetic, um, but it ca you can also make it technical if you're working with uh, times of day and, and times of year and stuff like that. Um, so let's move right on to the add water function. <laughs> add water function, um, which adds a water layer to the map. Um, you can use. standard textures, a hex code, or a color string. And we're going to add a new line to our existing code. This time it's add water. And inside the brackets, what we put here is a new function called detect water. And we detect water from the elevation matrix and make sure the color is going to be the same as the rest of our map, desert. Now, the way this works is you add the water to the map 
by using the function which determines flat regions on the map. So you can change the parameters, but uh, what happens is this add water function seeks out parts of the matrix where the changes in value are essentially nil. And so the, if you look at the map here on the right, there's this flat region where the elevation doesn't seem to change at all, and that's because it's, it's, it, it's ready to be rendered as water. Um, so this is how it ends up looking. We have a nice river here, it identifies that there's no change in elevation in these regions and show it, and so it colors it with water. Now, of course, you don't have to stick with this. You can do something like that. You could add basic colors and we get a nice red river like that. Um, you can experiment with all kinds of, um, all kinds of different color palettes, um, but we'll stick with the uh, regular theme for this session. Okay. So now we'll use one of the, um, the more, perhaps more computationally demanding uh, functions here. We're gonna add a ray traced layer from that sun direction as well. Um, ray tracing simulates a variety of optical effects. Um, such as reflection, refraction, soft shadows, etc. Um, and I'll add one more comment in just a minute, but let's get ahead with doing this ray tracing and we'll see what the effect is like. The new function to do ray tracing is not add water, but add shadow. And so we add shadow inside this function we put here, ray shade. Uh, we tell that we're going the data source is going to be the elevation matrix as normal, and we also have to put a variable number uh, in there as well. So this number, um, I'll add this comment now, the variable seems to suggest intensity of light and quality of material. Um, I'm not familiar enough with the uh, physics and the mathematics of how this works, um, but for now um, you can think about this this variable as adjusting the intensity of the light, and I'll show you what I mean now. Let's give it a tech sector ray shade, and now you can see it's add an extra layer of shadows. If we go down to 0 0.1, you can see that it's much darker, it starts to look a bit like a PS2 game or something. And then if we go all the way up to, say, 2, it's extremely bright. And so that kind of change in intensity, almost like the contrast uh, on a TV, um, gives us varying degrees of light intensity, and you can render it accordingly. Um, but I'll leave it at 0 0.5 for the moment. And that um, is for the moment, as far as we're going to go in terms of ray tracing, um, we're going to, well, in fact, no, we're going to add one more, apologies, we're going to add one more list, one more uh, layer, and we're going, here it's going to be, we're going to add an, what's called an ambient occlusion shadow layer, uh, which models light lighting from atmospheric scattering. Um, again, we're going to have a new, another numeric variable um, for the ambient shade, um, which darkens areas um, that darkens areas that have less scattered light from the atmosphere. This results in valleys oops, being sorry being darker than flat areas and ridges and so let's take a look at how that would play out we'll take our original lines of code and then we're going to add one more add shadow 
And this time we type in ambient shade. Again, our data source is always going to be elevation matrix. And we'll stick with the same variable just for the moment. And let's see finally how this looks. Takes a while to process. And there we go. And now we really start to see how realistic this uh, rendering can look once we add additional layers of shadowing. Um, again, we can go up and down uh, in various ways to change the visual effects. That makes it a little darker. I'm going to return to our original variable, but of course um, you can experiment as you like. Now, um, we're going to do some 3D rendering, um, and an optional step here, just so that you know um, how to do this in the future if you ever need any troubleshooting, we're going to open an RGL window. Uh, this changed recently, um, so the new instruction is we open, within the RGL package, we do open 3D. And all, the, all this does is, if we're lucky, it opens up a little window for us here. Uh, nothing particularly special, there's nothing in it right now, um, but this little instruction just opens up a window for us. I'm going to close it again now, um, but know that if you need to open one of those windows, that is how you do it. So, here, one of our final stages now is to use plot 3D uh, to create a 3D model of the matrix and render it in a separate window. Again, we'll take almost well we'll talk we'll take almost all of our code this time. We're going to leave the plotting line behind. So we've got our pipe and in the final line of instruction, I'm going to copy and paste it here from something I did earlier. It's a gen it's a generic set of um, conditions or a set of configurations for this. But what's important to bear in mind is you start with the function plot 3D, then you use the data source, and then the rest of the uh, variables here are to set up the view um, that you're going to see. So for example, here at the end we have the window size, the zoom, and a couple of other variables, right? But if you want to just keep it a very normal generic setup, you can copy these, these, uh, these inputs here. So this will take, this will take uh, maybe a couple of seconds. And uh, let's execute and see what we get. And there we go. It takes a minute or so. This is not a particularly demanding model, um, so it doesn't take too long. But bear in mind that if you use bigger uh, data sources, it is going to take you longer to get this generated. But you can click and drag to see different parts of the model. And of course, if you like, you can also zoom out and in. Be careful because there's, all, there's really no limit to how far you can zoom in and out. So if you uh, if you have a dodgy mouse, then it's gonna it's gonna need to be uh, reloaded from time to time. So that's looking really nice. Um, I'm going to put this window to one side over here, and we're going to quickly uh, do a couple more things just so that we know, um, just so that we can do some things with our uh, our newly found 3D model. One. A uh, useful function is to turn the RGL window into an image in the plot window. Um, and all you need to do here is type in render snapshot. We don't even need to put anything inside the brackets here. Whatever we have on our RGL window right now, let's choose a, we can choose a nice dramatic view. Um, just type in render snapshot here execute the function, and what you get here in the plot is a nice JPEG of the current view in the Archer window. Very handy for if you want to export a nice a nice quick image uh, of what you've been doing. Um, and for those of you who are interested in 3D modeling, um, here's an exciting function, which is to save the 3D model as a stereolithography file. Um, it's saved in your, oops, your working directory. So wherever you set your working directory for this project, that's where this project will net this this file will now go. So if I go to save underscore 3D print here, and I'm going to call it almat.stl, give it the right extension. Um, 
and I'll put here you you set the you set the dimensions of the model, um, which doesn't matter too much necessarily if you're planning to if you plan to uh, manipulate it in a different program you can still do that, um, but for the moment we can put 150 uh, and that unit is going to be in millimeters so 150 mil um, square uh, 15 centimeters uh, nice and manageable size so what this is is you're saving your current model as a stereolithography file which can be used in 3d modeling programs like rhino and ratio uh, sorry like rhino and sketchup um, and you can eventually uh, print it in 3d if you want using a 3d printer um, so let's um, do that and you'll see um, that it shows up in the directory that you're working. Um, let's see if we can find this. And here we are. And now it's being read not as a raster file, not as a matrix, but as a stereolithography file. And you can see it's come out really nicely, just as detailed as it's always been. And then you can go from there with other kinds of work. So that's it. Um, and I'm going to leave you there. From here, um, you can add all kinds of other things, uh, like scale bars, clouds. Um, you can render depth of field, um, which is to say you can make some parts of the image blurry and some in focus. Um, you can add population bars, um, and you can also add migration routes uh, for animals or for journeys, for example, like a trek of some kind. Um, and then finally, you can down you can download um, GIFs um, of the model. You can do flyovers, um, and you can also render in high quality. So that's um, an, uh, a suggestion of the kinds of things you can do afterwards, um, but we won't look at that now. That's um, something for you to look at individually. Um, but really, there's an enormous amount of potential with this. Um, and I hope this has been useful. Um, this is by no means the full length, the full list of uh, functions that you have available for Ray Shader. But this is a good, good place to get started. Uh, and you can return to this as a reference if you need. Um, and you can also contact me if you're having problems. Okay, thanks.